So how many of you may be like me, okay? I, through my marriage um, with Stacy, uh, there have been times along the way, okay? We've been married a long time. There have been moments recently um, where she has noted that maybe I could, I could listen a little better than I do sometimes. I don't know if you're like me. It's sometimes, like, you know, you know you're in trouble um, when it's like, you haven't heard a word I've said. And, and then you, no, I'm, no, I'm listening. I've been listening. And then the dreaded question, right? Okay, what, what did I just say? What did I say? Well, what, like, about what part about what you just said? <laughs> well, what, what, what are you asking about? Um, so, no, I'm doing a lot better. I'm doing better. You know, I traffic in words. That's what I do. I talk a lot. So some of you like me, I, I think out loud. I process a lot. So I married a woman who's a great listener, okay? And she's amazing. She's my therapist, and that helps a lot, too. But, um, I, you know, I lead that way. Like, I want people, I want wise people around me. I want to talk. Let's talk about it, right? And then others of us, I know, you need to kind of get, let me think on that for a while. I'll get back to you. Um, so we all are a little different, but how many of you like me, okay, mass confession, how many say, I, I could probably listen a little better than I do? Raise your hands, okay? And others of y'all aren't listening to what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> but, and certainly if you're, I know we're not all married, um, but in friendships, close friendships with mom and dad maybe, but in marriage, certainly it's like a mirror, you know, that comes at you and you see yourself, but there's a lot of different reasons we don't listen well. Um, and I think the main reason in our day is that we're distracted, we call it multitasking, but it's inattention. It's a lack of attention. It's not paying attention. But I think, too, that we can not listen because we are um, always trying to fix things. I know often this can be, you know, the, the man plays this role. Like, you're not listening. You're, just gonna, you're ready to offer solutions. Let me give you three things you can do. And here's why I'm going to fix this. Isn't that why you shared this with me? I fixed you. And now, I'm a hero. Thank you. And, and, you know, in your wife and, or, the, or the husband, you're like, I, I didn't share that with you to fix anything. I just want you to listen to me, right? Uh, I think, too, a lot of us were kind of, gosh, litigators at heart, probably. Somebody's talking, and we're going to, let me offer the solution. How can I rebuttal? How can I bring back? Okay, I'm gonna, we're not even listening, but we're ready to speak, right? And today we're going to talk about, as we've been talking about, the prayers of Christmas, okay, throughout this, this uh, month. We're going today to talk about uh, listening prayer, listening prayer, something that we really don't do so well. In fact, John chapter 10, Jesus says he's the good shepherd. He's talking about being the good shepherd. And he says, my sheep, my sheep hear my voice. They are the ones who hear my voice. There are other voices. They hear my voice and they follow me. Think about that. Isn't that the Christian life? That's it. Hearing from God, doing what he says. And he's implied again, there's a lot of voices out there. And he says, and I, and, they, and I know them by name. I call them by name. He knows your name. This communication with him and listening to him is very personal. It's on a corporate level, yes, but it's very focused. Last week, we talked about how Elizabeth and Zechariah Heard from God, Zechariah broke 400 years of silence. It wasn't that God wasn't working, he was quiet if anyone was listening, but he spoke to Zechariah. So years ago, um, it was on 60 Minutes, Mother Teresa was asked, um, it's like late 90s, I think Dan Rather was doing the interview, and he asked her, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she said, Mostly, I just listen. And he's a little thrown, so he flipped the question. Okay, what does God say to you when you pray? And she said, he listens. <laughs> and then she said, if you don't fully understand that, I can't really explain it to you. Meaning, you have to experience it. And even for a lot of us, we're like, wait, what? Because we don't practice the spiritual discipline of listening prayer. Not well. And I want to talk about that today because it's going to challenge a lot of us. Because I think that we've got prayer wrong. 
We come to God and what do we do? We talk, 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 and we ask him to do things for us. Lord, this is why, this is why I'm here. This is prayer, right? So Lord, help me with this and help me with this. And I'm anxious about this and help me with this and this person in my life and help me with this, my family and I'm with this. Amen. Lord, thank you so much. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. And he's going, I was going to say something. I was going to say something and you're out, you're gone. We all know that prayer is, is communication with God. And communication is two-way communication, but we really wrestle. We come to prayer believing he's like the big Amazon you know, delivery man in the sky. We, I'm going to click on this, I click on this, and let's do this and do this. And when it doesn't come, when it doesn't arrive, something's wrong. And not us. It's God. He must not answer my prayers. Let me, let me remind you, and I want to talk about this um, just briefly. Sermon within a sermon. Woo! Bonus. Christmas bonus. Um, and here it is. There are no such thing as unanswered prayers. Let's pull that out of our vocabulary. No such thing. No is a full sentence. Takes faith to go, I guess not. I'm going to trust him. Wait is not no. Wait is wait. Your request may not be right. It's not aligned with the will of God. Your heart may not be right. Timing might not be right. Watch this. When your heart is right, request is right, timing is right, God answers your prayers 100% of the time in the, in the affirmative. Yes is the answer. So could it be that prayer is much more than just asking God for things, but instead, watch this, prayer is actually aligning ourselves up with the will of God, praying according to his will in Jesus' name. Friends, don't miss this. The reason many of us don't pray, and I, I say it often, the number one reason for, for, for unanswered prayer is prayerlessness. Because we don't pray. Because many of us have become frustrated, God doesn't answer my prayers. He answers all of your prayers. Yeah, but he doesn't answer in the affirmative. Praise him that he does not. Because he knows better than you. So let's get back to prayer and be a prayer, prayerful people. Okay, so today we're going to look at the, I could argue, the most important person in the Bible who doesn't say a word. You know who it is? It's Joseph. He didn't, he didn't, he's not quoted anywhere. And yet he's the man that God chooses to be the earthly father of his son. We don't know a whole lot about him, but we, we do know. We, a lot of scholars believe that he probably died, actually. Um, after Jesus was 12 years old. So we see him there. But he probably died early. He's not anywhere in his ministry where Mary shows up always. And we hear a lot from Mary, a lot, a lot of words from Mary, the Magnificat and other places. But um, he's not at the resurrection. He's not, he's not around. Scholars believe that he probably died, which tells us a couple things. Side note, Jesus, the incarnate one who identifies with us, he knows what it is to lose a parent. Somewhere along the way. If you've lost a parent or loved one, by the way, today at three o'clock, we're going to gather in our chapel with a celebration of remembrance. It is a powerful time together. If you've lost a loved one, come and just pause. We're going to celebrate their life and remember them. And we're going to encourage one another. It is a sweet, sweet time today at three. So how about this? We also then, Jesus knows what it is to be raised by a single mom. Or a widowed, right? Mom, in part. He, he, he connects with us in so many ways. But what we're going to see here is Joseph is a man of prayer. And we know a lot about him by a simple phrase that we see in this passage. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Turn to Matthew 1 if you're not there. Because um, we're going to look at this passage. I mean, you know the Lucan account. Everybody turn in, in your Bible. Matthew 1. Well, we read it earlier. The Killebrews read this, uh, Matt did earlier. But this is the passage, Matthew 1. It corroborates with the Lucan account uh, that we looked at yesterday, and we'll look at more, for, uh, Luke 1 and 2. But um, after a genealogy, then it says this, verse 18. Now, the birth, this is the word genesis, by the way, in the Greek, or genesis, the origin, the start, the beginning of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed, betrothed to, Mary, to Joseph, 
before they, be, they came together, she was found to be with child by or from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they're betrothed. They're engaged. You, you probably know that. Now, there's a two-fold or a two-step process to get married in Judaism, particularly in the first, first century. And it was the Kedushin, which was the engagement, it's called, um, where two are pledged together. This is a lot more than, than our engagements that we have here. In fact, you could only break it by divorce. You could only break out of this, this commitment that you made. Because what was happening here, this is so powerful, it was a lot more communal. Families were a lot more involved. And some of you are like, no, my family is way too involved. You know? um, some of you, like young single, you know what I'm talking about. You're at Thanksgiving. You're like, no, they're way too involved and wanting me to get connected with so-and-so. And this. But it was often arranged marriage in large part. Not that the two didn't love each other, but the families would... would you know, really communal. And they're, they're from a small, small town in Nazareth. But, um, and as much as you teenagers, some of you just cringe at the fact of your parents, like arranging your marriage, your parents think it's a brilliant idea for a lot of good reason. Think about it. And sorry, students, young people, and some of you in your twenties, um, even, or older, a lot of young, the younger crowd. Now, a lot of people think that Mary was really young like a young teenager, uh, both of them, perhaps. Some say maybe not if Joseph died of natural causes, maybe he was a little older, but probably very young was, was typically the way this goes. And so when you're a teenager, you, you don't know. You don't even know who you are yet, frankly. You don't know who you ought to spend, the, the one person you ought to spend the rest of your life with. Your parents might know. They know you better. They know what you need. I remember dating, uh, and when I, you know, when a girl would meet my mom in particular, um, you know, I could tell that mom really liked her. And when she met Stacy, she's like, "Woo!" You know, I was like, this, "I'm on to something here," um, because I knew that my parents, mom and dad, knew me better in some ways than I knew myself and what I would need. Right. So I say all that because then comes the nashuin, it's called the the marriage itself, where then you get married. Okay. So they're real excited about getting married, and um, we, it seems we don't know a whole lot about Joseph, but here's what we, we know. He doesn't know what's going on in Luke chapter 1 and 2. Now think about this with me. If you know the story, um, Mary finds out she's pregnant, okay? It doesn't say that she runs to tell Joseph. And when we read the Luke account, she actually, what does she do? Do y'all remember? She leaves Nazareth and goes Where? To meet with whom? Elizabeth, her older cousin, wise, godly woman. Makes sense. Like Mary's, oh my gosh, a teenager. She goes and, and spends time. Do you, know, do you remember how long she was with Elizabeth? For three months. She comes back. See, Stacy and I had this long distance engagement when we were engaged. I mean, he's excited to see her. Like, man, this is the woman I'm going to marry. I haven't seen her. I didn't have cell phones, nothing. He doesn't know what's happening. Luke chapter one and two. Now, some of the conjecture, but we can, it seems this way. She comes back. She probably doesn't have a baby bump yet. She's three months pregnant. Um, can yes, you're back. I'm so glad to see you. This is amazing. Hey, yeah. Can, can we sit down? I, I want to talk about something. And she tells him that she's pregnant. And my guy knows there's only one way that happens. And you've thought about this before, perhaps. Imagine, what was he thinking? How was he feeling? Broken? Destroyed? Angry? Betrayed? All the things. I mean, Joseph needs a miracle is what he needs. Look at verse 19. And her husband Joseph was being a just and will, uh, just man and willing, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, this is the phrase. He was a just man. With this one phrase, we know a lot about him. Because this meant that he was righteous, is the other word. Righteous and just are two words that are used simultaneously or, or along the way, same word. Depending on, on the context, it's translated differently. So you say, well, how would they know? Why is it translated differently? It's, it, there's a nuance here. To be righteous is to be uh, made right before God. That's to be just, to be just before him, to be made right before him. And this happened by keeping the law. 
So he would hear from God. He knew the law. He knew it and he sought to obey it. That's what this means. In fact, the NIV literally says he was faithful to the law. The word just or righteous because that's what it means. Now we know in in Luke chapter uh, one, what we read last week, it spells it out for us. It says they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. That's Joseph. That's what it means to be just. Now, now righteousness, if, that, if, if the nuance is right with God, just to be just means that this is overflowing into your life. He was a just man. And we see this with Mary. He's wanting to do the right thing. But watch this. To follow the law, here, here's what this means. To be just meant he's following the law, obeying the law, which has been his life. He knows the law. He knows what it means to be just. And the law says if you commit adultery, you're to be stoned to death. In Leviticus 20, Deuteronomy 22, it says both are to be stoned. My guy is in trouble. He's got a dilemma. In fact, John Calvin, in his uh, commentary on Matthew, he says that the first portion of that, that he was a just man, then the latter that says, and he didn't want to put her to shame, uh, so he wanted to divorce her quietly. He says the, the latter doesn't explain the, the former. Instead, he pits them up against each other and says, this is the dilemma that Joseph finds himself in. He wants to follow the law, but he doesn't want to put her to shame. He loves her. Even if he thinks, you're crazy. I didn't, this is not my child. He still wants to do the right thing. I mean, Joseph is is amazing. We don't know a lot about, we know that he, um, he may have died. We know what his profession was, don't we? You know what it was? Anybody? He was a, he's a carpenter. Um, yes. I don't want to blow your mind and all the images you have of Jesus, little Jesus working in the carpentry shop. He was, but he was, he was a craftsman is really the word. Blah, maybe carpenter. Some say he was a Mason, but when we only know that from one place, it's in uh, Matthew 33, 15, I think, or, or somewhere back. There's not 33 chapters in Matthew. It's 13. Matthew 13, um, verse 55. Where, and they're referencing Jesus, saying, isn't he the carpenter's son? That's the only place we know. And then we have all these stories that spin out of that. But, again, don't want to ruin all your, your images there, um, of him working alongside his, his dad. He did, we can imagine, did that as a kid. But I say all that because we, we know a lot about him, because of how he deals with this and how he's a just man seeking to do what is right, what is just. But my whole point here is this. He is trapped between following the law, being a man of truth, holding to the truth and being a man of grace, extending grace to his betrothed, his fiance and saying, man, I've got to fit. He needs a miracle is what he needs. Uh, You've probably found yourself there at times. But how does he become this kind of just person? By walking with Jesus or with with the Lord and knowing the law every day. So as we think about the prayer of listening, here's what I want you to see. Three things real quick. First is we listen. And I'm going to challenge you with some real practical stuff. We listen every day. And I can say throughout the day. To walk with Jesus, to be a disciple, to follow in the steps of our rabbi is to listen to him and obey him. And this is a constant communing. It's what we call abiding in him, right? The good shepherd speaks. And as we listen to him, we follow him. Joseph listened to God every day and he sought to obey him in everything that he does. But think about this too. Not only let's, you know, he's, he's just a normal guy going about normal life, coming from a little small town of Nazareth. And this is where life happens for us, right? Not the big giant stuff, spectacular things, but just the daily grind of doing laundry and going to work and doing the stuff and putting kids down and whatever your life is, it's just doing the normal things. But all the while communing with the Lord, abiding in him. How do you do that? By listening to him and by obeying what he says. And this is the way Joseph was living his life. But he also, I'm sure, is probably a little nervous about, well, what are they going to say about me? I'm seeking to be a just man. Here's a woman that everybody's going to think it's me. Like, what about me? I'm sure he wrestled with that. 
And that's the problem that many of us run into in terms of obeying to doing the right thing is what about me and the approval of man is what uh, Paul calls it in Galatians 1 10. And, and so, so he's concerned about all the labels going to come his way. Here's what I've learned. If you're a Christian in this world, if you're a Christian leader in particular, and we all are to some degree, um, if you don't like labels, you're in the wrong business because we're going to be labeled certain things in certain, in certain ways. And we're going to stay true to the Lord like Joseph was just to follow him. Jesus, if we're following the way of Jesus, he was called a drunkard. He was called demon possessed, friend of sinners, all those things. He, he, was, he, he was way too much for everybody. They tried to label him and they had a hard time doing so. He was way too conservative when it came to the law. He was like, okay, you've heard it said, but I'm taking this further. You want to talk about truth? If you even lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. They're like, dang, what? And he was way too liberal. He was, today, he was woke, like nobody's business. Because he was all about racial reconciliation, about caring for, for the immigrant, for people outsiders. Everyone was loved. Everybody has a place at the table, not just those who are moralistic and right and good. I remember some years back, um, I, I don't know if it's was some article or something, um, where I, someone described me as a Christian activist. I was like, I'll take that. In fact, that's redundant. Following Jesus is to live out our faith, right? And yes, in our personal walk and relationships, but in the world, this is what Joseph's trying to do. Righteous before God, just to do the right thing and get careful. Being just is to care for those who maybe can't care for themselves, to be, to, to be help to those who, who need help, to care for the ostracized, for the broken, for the oppressed, the attacked. This is where Mary is. And Joseph says, okay, I've got to do the right thing. He needs a miracle is what he needs. And he gets one. Look at this. We listen to understand. We listen every day, but we listen. Friends, how do you know what to do? How do you know how to walk this life? You listen to God to understand. Look at what happens to him. God speaks because he's in a pattern of listening. And here it is. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And I know some of you are thinking, dang, I'd like an angel. I mean, really? How does God speak to me? We'll get there. Saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Mary already knows all this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, which literally means God saves. For he shall save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's just hearing what he knows in Scripture. He already knows God's word. He knows the prophecy. And the, and the angel in the vision is saying, this is what's happening. This is it. You've heard about this. Joseph listens okay, to what the angel has to say, and he's listening in order to gain, and he gains greater and greater understanding. If he wants to be the hero in this thing, he's got to listen to God. And the same is true for you. Listen every day constantly and listen to understand. Lord, tell me more. Tell me more. So here it is. Let's get real practical. How do we listen? Let me give you some B attitudes, okay, of listening. B, first, be quiet. Be quiet. Turn off the noise. This is big. Don't let that just fly by. You need to write that down. I'm old enough to remember, some of you are old enough like me, to remember a thing called boredom. It used to be a thing. And I know you can still get bored. We just tell our kids, you're too smart to be bored. Stop. Do something. You know, whatever, when they're little. But I remember um, you could be, back in the day, if you were born, say, 90, 95 or later, you don't know what I'm talking about here. But let me just share something with you. Um, there was a time when you'd be like standing at your favorite you know, coffee shop or whatever, just standing there, and you would just stand there. And actually like talk to people. I mean, you'd be aware of what's going on around you. There was a time you could be in an airplane, like flying over somewhere like Kansas or something, reading a book, 
and you finish it before you thought you would finish the book and you would just sit there. We did that. Fully aware of what's going on around us. Moments where we could just be quiet and still. Like you'd be on an elevator, get on an elevator and just stand there. And the extroverts by the fifth floor, they'd know everybody's name. <laughs> and, and it was, I mean, it was a different time. Those were moments. And a million of them, a million moments in time where you can be fully aware of what's happening around you, fully aware to God, available to God, portals of moments of prayer. Lord, help me as I go into this meeting. Or God, I'm, I'm right here. I'm, I'm present. Microsoft asked um, or made a statement in a survey when I have it written here. It says this. They asked, where is it? When we, yeah, here it is. Um, when nothing, here it is, when nothing is occupying my attention, the first thing I do is reach for my phone. 77% of all adults. So this little experiment that we have in our front pockets called omnipresence is not helping us. And we talk about it a lot because it's one of the biggest deterrents to really hearing from God, no listening to him. So we listen in quiet we get quiet. We listen in silence. Saint uh, John Climacus is a, is a sixth century Syrian monk you've never heard of, but he spent most of his day praying on the top of Mount Sinai, a monastery up there. Most of his life he spent time praying. And he, he said this. He said, the friend of silence draws near to God. If, if silence is your friend, you're going to draw near to God. No one ever said that about noise. You don't have to live in a monastery to live like that. It's harder in North Dallas because it takes spiritual discipline and real discipline to get off your screens, get away from the noise. Everywhere we go, there's noise. You got to have, evidently, we have to have it in an elevator. We got to have it in a restaurant. You got to have it at the mall. Everywhere there's music and noise. So it takes real discipline. C.S. Lewis, in his incredible satire, the screw tape letters, has the demons railing against silence as a danger to their cause, which is the demise of the human soul. So senior demon screw tape calls the devil's realm a kingdom of noise. This is what we're trying to create. And he claims we will make the whole universe a noise in the end. Friends, we've got to combat this. So we've got to be quiet, okay? We've got to be still. Here's the next one. Not just silence, but be still. To be fully present, to be still before the Lord, and we hear his gentle, small voice. Some have called it the sound of gentle silence that speaks to us. And I know I'm stepping into some territory that many of us have little knowledge about experientially. And if you're, if you're tracking with me here, you, you hear the story and you go, well, well man, Joseph, of course, he got an angel. He got a vision. I still believe that happens, by the way. Got Muslim friends who've come to Christ through visions and dreams. And some of you, I, I was asked that recently. You think God still speaks through dreams? And I, well, you got to be, be careful. It's going to align with his word. He's going to align with what he's already told us. So you got to be in his word, right? You got to be in his word. Listen, if you want to hear from God, it's like, how can I hear from him? Back to Mother Teresa. I just listen. How do we hear from God? Uh, he wrote a book for that. And I've talked about this often. Friends, at some point as followers of Jesus, you're going to have to open your Bible. You want God to speak to you? Be in his word daily, multiple times a day. You want God to speak to you audibly? Read his word out loud. Read the Bible out loud. If you want to hear from him audibly, okay? And he will speak to you. He will speak to you. And that's where our prayers start to align up with his will. And we pray in Jesus' name. We pray according to his will. Because we know what he desires. And it's not, give me this, give me this, give me this. Instead, it turns to, Lord, how can I join you in what you're doing in the world? We, we said it this way. The big question is not, what is God's will for me? My life? 
What is God's will? Full stop. How can I join? That's what's happening with Joseph. He hears from God because he's in a pattern of listening to God. But watch this. You've got to be, not only in his word, you've got to be in community. This is so important. We don't just go off on our own. Being in solitude doesn't mean isolation. This is hard for some of us. Some of us are like, I love isolation. Get me quiet. Get away from me. And I get that. We all should go there. Bonhoeffer wrote about this where he said, don't let that person go hide out. But let the person who must be in community stay there. Instead, there's a balance. And so you've got to be in community because it's there that we we hear God speak as well, right? And it's there. Don't miss this. In community is where you, like a mirror, it shows you who you are because your relationships. You might bump up against somebody. Oh, man, I need to forgive you. I'm sorry I said that. Unless I want to serve you. None of that happens by yourself. It happens only in communities where we grow in grace and grow to understand God's purpose for us, right? And then finally, we can be present. We can can really be present. You can be quiet. And I'm going to challenge you before we're done. The problem in our world today for, for Christians, problem for everybody, is not hedonism. It's distraction. This is true for all of us. It's going to take discipline, gang, and I'm going to ask you to practice it today, tomorrow. I've been doing this throughout this particular month to say, I'm just, here's something I'm doing. I want to challenge you with this. When you pray, you just stop and pray. And when you do, I want you to take five minutes out of a 24 hour day, five minutes, quiet, no music, no noise, alone, quiet before God. And say, Lord, speak to me. Some of y'all have never done that, perhaps. I challenge you to do so. And listen to what he says. And here's the challenge. I know, because you're thinking, well, how do I know it's not like just in my mind? Like, you know, that I'm just making up stuff. Of course he's going to speak to you in your mind. How else is he going to do that? But the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. See, when we give him our mind, yes, it's going to match up with scripture. Okay, he's not going to say something crazy. It's going to, okay. But like earlier, some of you are even uncomfortable at the beginning of this message. Look at Lord, speak to me. He speaks to you in your mind, which is the gateway, yes, to the soul. He speaks to your soul. There are times he speaks without words, and you can listen without words. It's his presence, and you just embrace it. But we listen every day. We listen to to understand. Lord, tell me more about what you have for my life and what you want me to do. And finally, we listen. We listen to obey. And then we'll land with this. See, see, Joseph doesn't just go, well, that was cool. I just had a vision. That was awesome. And go on about his life. He adjusts his life accordingly. Look at this. When Joseph woke up from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, so he did it. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph needed a miracle, and he got one because he listened to God. But here's the thing. You could argue it's not listening prayer unless you obey and do what he says. In fact, you might know the Shema. Y'all know the Shema? Hear, O Israel. Hear is the word, Shema. The same word is the word obey. Same root word, hear and obey. Why? Because in the Hebraic mind, to hear was to obey. If you didn't obey, you didn't hear it. Now, some of you parents, we try that, right? Like, you do what I say. And if you don't do what I say, you didn't hear what I said. Same way with God. And all of his commands are loving. And he says, do this to hear is to obey. Only in the Western mind can we say, I believe that. Whew, I'm all in. That is truth. I'm all about that. And not even have it affect our lives. And not even live that way. And we fool ourselves. And Satan has sifted us like wheat. Or we claim to believe certain things and we don't act them out. Joseph was caught in a dilemma He needed a miracle, and he got one. But friends, you and I are caught in a dilemma as well. You could say that that Joseph was caught between truth and grace. Jesus is described as a man who lived full of truth. Full, not some, 
not half-half, full of grace and full of truth. And he's called us to do the same. But it's all because he has met the holy demands of God for us. The just one, the righteous one, lived the perfect life for us. So on the cross, he lives the perfect life, and then he dies on the cross where God's inflexible holiness, the just, perfect judge, and his holiness and righteousness, okay, collides with our sin and the love of God and his grace, undying love and his complete justice and holiness collide on the cross, on Jesus. And he makes a way for us. Dilemma is solved. And all we've got to do is fall into that and believe and say, yes, I receive that. And like Joseph, step into it as an obedient follower of Jesus. But here's the thing. I've got to close with this and we're going to close with a beautiful song together. But I want you to hear this. 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says this. This is what he was wrestling with. The Lord led me to this. Where, where it says... Through Christ, God has reconciled us to himself, okay? To God, through the cross, his undying love. He made a way. But this verse goes on, it says this, and he gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, and here it is, not counting their sins against them. He reconciles us in our sin by not counting our sins against us because he takes on the punishment. He takes on the power of sin in our lives so that we can live the life. The verse goes on to say, so that we might be ambassadors, that we might enter into reconciliation among others. Every person you know is caught in a dilemma, seeking to be good, completely wrecked by their sin. And they need to know there's a savior who's come. So friends, this week, let's keep going back to what Christ has done. If Christmas means anything, it's a call to come back home, that he's come to rescue us from our sin, to obey him. Christmas is one big interruption. And it can serve as that on the calendar too, I suppose. But remember, the interruption that's come is so that you can bring peace and justice into the world, people that you know. It's like Dr. King said, peace is not the absence of conflict. We're going to have that, but it's the presence of justice. So we step into that space and do what's right with people and help reconcile them to God and to one another. But it starts with us. And so let's be those kind of peacemakers in the world. Let's listen to him. Practice it this week. Listen to him every day. Take my five-minute challenge. Uh, Listen to understand. Lord, tell me more. Tell me more. I want to understand your will and listen. Okay? Listen in order to obey him. What do you say? Let's do it. Here's the question we have for everybody across our campus. What will you stop listening to in order to hear God's voice this week? What will it be for you? Because we got to get rid of the noise. And I want you to remember that. Write it down. Remember that question. What are you going to stop listening to? in order to just hear him speak, okay? So, let's do this. We're going to pray together, and then Melody's going to come and lead us in a song. And what I want you to do, just bow your heads and close your eyes with me right now. And I want you to think about your life, the challenge you've heard today. The Spirit has spoken. He speaks through his word, through your pastor, through other people, in your connect group. What is he saying to you today? And let's all remember that, that holy night. We call it, or we sing it, the silent night. Where God spoke. The word became flesh. Christmas means that he's come to speak to you. Will you listen to him? Even now, listen to him. What is he saying to you?